All righty. Well, uh, today we are uh, have the, the 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 bearded stud Evan Blackerby. Um, he nice. uh, heads up a, a, a house church called Multiply Church in High Point, and he works with the Baptist State Convention of North Carolina. And uh, so he works with the collegiate ministry team. And uh, you were a what a campus minister at UNCG for several years, correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. Nice, nice. Well, uh, uh, this week, um, uh, Evan here is going to help us uh, understand a little better the house church approach to uh, church planting. They're about a year into it now, correct? Uh, a year into the actual, we moved into the neighborhood a year ago. Gotcha. All right. Awesome. Yep. And so I've known Evan for about a year and a half or so, uh, mm-hmm. give or take a little bit. And as uh, so we've been connected through a few things that we've done at Piedmont and uh, through some stuff I've done. Uh, uh, in the state convention, and uh, he's a great guy, a good friend. So thanks for uh, for joining us today. And um, this uh, this lecture this week, we're discussing um, basically uh, when you're preparing for a church plant, it's kind of selecting a focus group, community, and even uh, a model and approach um, or style of church, so to speak. And so. Um, what we're discussing a lot in class and then uh, another uh, lecture that we're uh, doing for this is uh, basically the you know picking a model that uh, not just is the the coolest sounding or you know the one that is the the one that everyone is doing all the books are being written about but the one that fits both your leadership style and the context that you are you know being sent to and so um, Good. Today I thought it'd be really good, good. for you to kind of um, kind of exposit for us the church planting uh, approach um, in uh, house churches because uh, I know you've done that. And so um, just kind of introduce a little bit. We're talking about uh, essentially summarizing five different approaches to starting a new church and. Um, these five approaches are the uh, traditional um, style where uh, basically someone um, says, hey, we need a new church on this side of town or this community, uh, moves in, starts uh, just some basic disciple making, uh, get, gathers those for a Bible study. When that Bible study grows to about 20, 30 people or so, a few families start worshiping on Sunday morning a little more formally, start adding structures, leadership, and so forth, and start doing small groups. Uh, so that's kind of that traditional model. Then we're looking at the big launch model where you have a large large core team from a uh, from a, a mother church so to speak and uh, they go and uh-huh. basically you take a, a church a prepackaged church body and you move to a city and then you do some preview services and get ready and then hope to have a, a good number of the, of the community come this is the the, uh, the missional incarnational approach uh, which is essentially um, uh, more focused on kind of a missional community base where uh, it has a lot of uh, kind of dual uh, hybrid nature of both uh, house church type feel along with gathered worship um, and some other programs type thing but a very much organic nature to a lot of the uh, evangelism disciple making and mission type pieces yeah. and uh, we're also talking about the satellite model where you have one church that has multiple campuses um, that either are part of the, 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 uh, the kind of central campus church or they become Become an autonomous, and then uh, today, as we we're discussing with you, the kind of organic house church approach, and uh, so those are kind of the five models that we're looking at um, here this week um, to, to to help students kind of uh, assess and see where they are, how they are wired, um, and then also what type of plant uh, the community that they're going to need. Um, uh, I was. Uh, I don't know if you know that um, there's a, a planter in uh, near Denver, Colorado, Alan uh, Carr, and he was with the Southern Baptist Group out there. And I was in, I was I was actually skyping him a couple years ago, just talking about different ideas in church planting. And he mentioned how uh, he actually had uh, started a house church, and from his house church, they had planted 30 other churches in the Denver, Colorado Springs area. Not all of them were house churches; some were more traditional style, some some were the kind of missional community based, just a different style. But it was interesting. He noted that. Um, there was one particular community that they could not start a house church in and the reason was that community had a history um, of a cult that met in a home and Mm -hmm. had ended up uh, doing some harm to some children and all kind of things and so that particular community just rejected any idea for planting a house church so the guy that they sent to plant there planted a more traditional style church so anyways we're talking about how some communities may not be the best fit or the person may not be the best at leading and so um, I've got just a a few uh, kind of simple questions for you to kind of look at um, and, and help us kind of understand what you've done uh, there at, at High Point with uh, Multiply Church. And um, and so uh, let's kind of start with, with where you are. Tell us a little bit about the community where you moved into and uh, why that particular community. 
Sure, sure. That's a good question. Um, well, hey, everyone. Uh, yeah, why we moved into that community. We, uh, take you back a little bit, we were, we were on mission uh, with a church that was more attractional based. Um, uh, great friends of ours, great community. Um, but what we discovered was that we didn't know how to reach or love on our neighbors in a very tangible way. So we we were convicted about this, and this is all over a span of you know a few years. Uh, but God kind of started tugging at our hearts and saying, you know, you really, you guys really are awful at doing this whole uh, life on life missional approach to living, doing church rather than uh, being a part of a church, that kind of thing. And so we discovered that um, not only did we not know our neighbors, we, we kind of looked back and went, when have we actually made a disciple? Um, you know, life on life, one person to another, gospeling each other. Um, when have we done that in the past year or two? Um, and what I had discovered was, um, sure, I was a part of a church that was uh, doing that. But I was in leadership roles and that kind of thing, and I, I was also a part of uh, being a campus minister on a campus, on a large college campus, uh, State University of 20,000 students. And so a lot of my work, uh, as, as many of your leaders are going to know, but it's, uh, is with other Christians. Mm -hmm. And so you spend a lot of time in the Christian bubble. And, and I just found myself over and over again just kind of going, ah, there's got to be something where, you know, God's going to be, you know, I could just see God hands-on mm -hmm. moving in their lives and the nitty-gritty and that kind of thing. So we, we started to look at what does it look like to pour into our jobs more? Okay, we can, we can pour into our jobs. Okay, but, you know, that's, you know, a quarter of the week. What's, what's the rest of the week look like? Um, it looks like this or that. I, I guess it came down to where are we going to not be able to escape from making disciples? Hmm. And we came down to the neighborhood approach of missional communities. And so our missional community uh, started forming uh, our church missional community, um, started forming outside of the neighborhood in which we now live. And we started praying together and meeting together and going through some different uh, books and different uh, resources. I'm not going to throw those out there right now, you know, just to, I'm not going to sway everybody. But what we kind of landed on was, hey, we're together. God has put us in a place. What do we do with that? Let's, let's think about whether or not we went into a neighborhood and do life on life for a period of time. And let's see what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So we started praying for an, over a neighborhood, walking through it, uh, walking, prayer walking a neighborhood in High Point uh, with our community uh, that was kind of a forming church and decided that uh, there was this one neighborhood in High Point that uh, we started connecting with and God started pulling on our heartstrings and, and um, it's right next to a high school and a middle school and we said, you know, this neighborhood is huge. It's got different socioeconomic. Um, we're kind of, you know, middle, middle class, right there in the middle. And we know that we can reach down one socioeconomic and reach up a little bit. Uh, we are very, you know, we've got some multicultural aspects of the people in our, um, in our community. Uh, we've got an, uh, a girl who was born in India, uh, some a, a lady with... Chinese um, descent, and so we've got some different angles that we can approach that. They work with refugees over in High Point, so we said, okay, this is a good baseline neighborhood that we could base our initial missional community from, and mm -hmm. then um, we, we moved in, and spare you all the details of signing contracts and the whole deal, but we moved into the neighborhood, and uh, it was about a year ago, and we then... Um, figured out that we had no clue what we were doing from there so yeah yeah <laughs> nice nice yeah, so. well um 
so let's talk because I know probably you know this last year you've been building relationships. I know that even um, uh, you even sent uh, one of your uh, folks, uh, Andrea, who actually lives very close to me, what thirty minutes away from yeah. from you, was was driving down. So she's actually connected with ours and is one of sure. our uh, key key folks. Uh, her and her her husband. Um, and so I know you guys have have grown, have actually sent out some people, so to speak. Right. So tell me a little bit about the the kind of group formation. I um, mean, I really don't not looking at numbers, so to speak, but how is it that people are kind of coming into these the Bible study and missional community that you're um, uh, developing? Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I've got all these calendar notifications popping up on my thing. There literally oh, yeah. were um, thirty of them, I think. <laughs> So, <laughs> busy guy. Well, huh? <laughs> this is a good example. This is a good example. Okay, let me let me share this. You know, in our missional community, um, the the way we view it is two different things. We have the church, and that is the entity that um, you know we did the whole official thing by getting the five hundred one c three, and we did the thing where we would go out and get a bank account. And that is the church. That is our multiply church, okay? That's where we uh, quote-unquote tithe to or whatever. Um, but within that, um, we only really have one community started so far. So we have one missional community within that, which is in the neighborhood. Um, so that, they're two separate kind of things. One is within the other, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. The, yeah, mission, yeah. the Multiply Church, uh, the long-term goal would be for Multiply Church to send out dozens of missional communities, um, you know, hundreds and thousands and thousands. And, and right, right. They but, creep all across North yeah, America. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but yeah. in reality, our community, uh, we've had to kind of reteach ourselves. Wait a second. We're not just Multiply Church. We are Ferndale Gatewood missional community in Old Emory. Uh, getting as specific as we can. Um, so, I, I think your question, I, I have connectedness, uh, the strength of connectedness, so it, it'll go anyway. You can focus me if you like. But, we we kind of started going, okay, it, it's going to be a, a good filter for us to say we're in a very tight geographical location, because if someone can't move into that neighborhood or isn't going to drive in for a substantial amount of time, then they're not going to want to be a part of our community. So that mm-hmm. presents some problems and that presents some good good things too. Um, so yeah, we, we had a, a, a lady named Andrea who is a, a former student of mine at UNC Greensboro and then her now husband who were driving in from Winston and um, doing a ton of driving and we said, you know, We want to be friends with them. We want to be awesome friends with them. But here's the deal. We can't figure out how they're actually going to be on mission in our neighborhood, on our street. They're not going to know the neighbors like we are. They're not going to figure out, uh, you know, what their favorite colors are. I don't know. You know, they're not going to know um, their backgrounds. They're just not going to have time to do that, drive, go to school like they are, work jobs, and... um, so we kind of said, you know, it is good for us to send you to where you need to be. Now, that might be stopping in once a month or once every few weeks or whatever over here, being a part of our lives such that we can pour into you, continue to send you out, give you truth in right. your life, and maybe say some things that maybe somebody else wouldn't say or do something like that. Um mm-hmm. But we also know that you're not going to be on the same mission field in the same way that we are. There's, it's just not possible unless you were to move into the neighborhood. So um, <clears throat> that's created a really good filter for us. Um, hmm. On the flip side of that, it creates a situation where we have to be very intentional to draw people in that we can send back out. So if we're talking about multiplying churches and we're talking about planting new missional communities, we've got to create on-ramps for what we're doing to where people can actually get to um, the DNA. Do you get what I'm saying? So we're not having to leave our community to go give the DNA. So that somebody could come in, like do an internship or a family friend or whatever, they come hang out, and then we say, man, you're getting it. You're getting this stuff. This is awesome. How can we send you back out? So, um, Yeah. 
So that's stuff we're wrestling with right now, just in full transparency. So yeah, that right is right. that kind of answer your question? Yeah, the yeah, and for um, us has been very helpful as a as a good filter. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Um, and uh, I know even in a, even our church here in Winston Salem kind of has a very similar approach in that we do have our gospel communities very similar to what you have in different parts of the city. And I think uh, with us, you know, we gather, we still gather weekly on Sunday mornings at a sure. more central spot. But the majority of what we would consider church is actually done outside in our smaller groups. I think there's about 11 or 12. Most of most of ours are uh, Wake Forest college students, and we actually live near Wake Forest University, so it just makes sense. And uh, so that's kind of our neighborhood. But we also have a citywide vision as far as our whole church. Yeah. That's kind of that fits part with that kind of more hybrid, uh, gathered, scattered approach. Yes. Um, so, are you folks, um, you talk about multiplying different communities out. Would it be that uh, is a long term goal to have them to start gathering um, in a more centralized worship location? Or are you still trying to maintain each missional community's autonomy and just kind of network and love each other? Uh, Yes, somewhat. Um, it, it seems that every time we talk about trying to get all the Christians together, we end up losing some steam. Um, just like everybody else, you know, um, unless you have a very intentional, uh, what you guys are talking about, uh, unless you have a very intentional approach to gathering everybody in the unified body of missional gospel communities, whatever whatever each group calls them. I know everybody calls them something different, right? So, yeah. um, but if we were to have 10 missional communities of different neighborhoods, sure, I could consider us getting together, you know, once a month or something and kind of going, hey, yeah. how does this, how, do, how can we celebrate together? Um, but not so much for understanding how we can uh, squash down the gospel or squash something mm -hmm. that uh, some kind of strategy or something it would be more celebration based because we understand gotcha. that and, and you understand this too Dustin um, the people are best in the context that they understand and right. and we're, I'm going to understand with my missional community that context somebody else mm -hmm. is going to understand that context so um, I just want to be cautious when we start gathering with folks that it doesn't become a thing where you try to squash the context of everybody and where they're coming from. Because uh, that's often the case where it kind of becomes watered down or um, you just can't figure out how to, you know, you're trying to bridge gaps that you don't need to necessarily bridge because the gospel is good enough to bridge it. Right. You know, right. So, I know that. Yeah. 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 No, that that makes that makes uh, complete sense. And the interesting thing about this approach is that um, it's a lot of kind of pioneering in a lot of ways because it hasn't quite been done in this sense. And so, and, and they're all very different. There's no, uh, there's no Absolutely. one. So even we have these five uh, models or approaches. Yeah. But uh, with each of these, you can go a thousand ways. And so it's kind of yeah. you know we're trying to boil down. So I, I appreciate your perspective because uh, some say well, I mean I've heard you were. Uh, you were talking about the five different models that you're talking about. I'm going, well, I mean, I'm kind of all five. I mean, yeah, I was about to say that too. Stance, you know, I'm kind of like, <laughs> right. oh man, I could, you know, if I had a big core team, I would have done a big launch, you know? So you, you're um, just indecisive. That's what it is, right? You just there, you couldn't decide. So like, throw them all. You know, I, I can see the good in them all. But, <laughs> yeah. But in, realistically, I can, I can say, okay, if I have a holistic approach to a strategy to reaching all the neighborhoods and all the people groups and all the pockets um, of lostness or whatever in a city, then I have to be able to say uh, one size doesn't fit all and mm -hmm. it has to be contextualized to the, the pockets that are there. There are going to be some people right. in our neighborhood who are going to hate the idea of what we're doing. We have to be okay with that and be okay with them uh, landing at a more traditional church because that's what they know of as church. Um, right. If that's a part of the process for them and for what God's doing in their life and the journey, um, we're going to have to be super okay with that and, and ac mm. actually celebrate that rather than uh, being like, oh man, they didn't come to our disorganized, um, unplanned uh, church service that meets in my den with four people and sings songs that they haven't heard on the TV or over their phones and we weirds them out and that kind of oh they didn't get that how did they not get that we didn't explain it well yeah. so I mean there is some level of 
having a lot of grace with yourselves as a community, having a lot of grace with the people around you, and understanding that the gospel is bigger than any one model or strategy. Yeah, uh, that's that's key, and that's exactly the point we're trying to hit on. Is you know, be flexible. Um, I was the one who, uh, you know, gosh, seven eight years ago, already had my model nailed down. I'm like, oh, this is what I'm going to do, and then I started realizing, wait a second, it may not fit me or the place I'm going yeah. to. Um, and so then I started to appreciate every single approach, and because y'all have their strengths uh, along with their weaknesses. So um, let, let's talk a little bit, kind of about kind of your your weekly rhythm of a church. So like a, you know, we're very familiar with the kind of more traditional. Uh, rhythm of church where there's like a, sure. a small group Sunday school, then worship, maybe even a midweek type service, small groups in homes, that sort of thing. What's the kind of weekly rhythm? What does it look like in the life of multiple church on a weekly basis? That is an excellent question. And you you heard me say that I had all these calendar notifications uh, popping uh-huh. up on my computer as we're doing this uh, conversation. So we, we have a person who is a police officer. I'll call him Brian because that's his name. And, um, you know, we're not... You know, whatever. If you look him up, he's probably around. He's in one of the police departments in the triad. So he operates on a four-day on, four-day off schedule with his work, okay? So he starts working at 4 p.m. on the days that he's working. Well, then he works until 3 a.m. So that cuts out four nights a week that we're going to be working or we're going to be able to get together. So And that changes one day every week. So if you have eight days, you know, it kind of rotates four days on, four days off. Um So what we have to do is we say, these two or three weeks, we're going to meet on Monday nights. Awesome. Or Tuesday nights. And then we say, okay, the following two or three weeks, we're going to meet on a Thursday night, you know. And we plan it out six to seven weeks in advance, and we kind of just go, okay. That way we can at least keep it consistent. But it's all based around the work schedules, the the times that – Kids don't have doctor's appointments, the, um, you know, whatever. Um, it's based around the lives of our people, and unashamedly so. It's not just a, we failed at scheduling Sunday mornings, so therefore we're going to start scheduling whatever we can get. Um, mm. No, I mean, it, it really is, how can we fit a legitimate time that's not just a, rush to get there, a rush to get out the door uh, into our lives. I mean, I, I'm, t- I'm thinking of trying to find a way to expand it from you know our two-hour gathering to a four-hour kind of dinner, this, this, this. Mm. Um, and, and even that doesn't cut it, um, just as far as gatherings. We're, we're discovering that it really takes a lot more. Uh, we walk the neighborhood every day that we can. Uh, when we first moved in, we were walking it for real every day. We walked up. Uh, mm. We walked our little block, our neighborhood block, every day, and uh, just asked God to kind of reveal what He wanted to reveal. And um, we would run into the folks who were living on the other side of the block, who was our in our community as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that is just as important as the gathering to us, um, mm-hmm. because we need to be in that day in day out kind of approach. Um, we've. We've hooked up with an app. Uh, there's a lot of different apps online that you can use for business chats and things like that, whether it's the Evernote chat or the um, Hip chat, or we use Slack as a work-based chat, chat room kind of thing. Uh, you can develop little channels on there. We have a channel for uh, our daily Bible reading with our group. We have a channel for the neighborhood itself, like the outreach-oriented mission part of it, like saying, here's how we can pray for the neighbor. This neighbor has got that going on, that kind of thing. Not in a creepy way. Don't let anybody know that. Um, but then we have, uh, you know, just general items and some or fails. We had Black Ruby Photo Wars for a little while, um, you know, just nice. where we, would, my wife and I would throw random photos of each other up uh, that were meant to embarrass the other ones. So... Um, ah. that kind of thing but you know having a day in day out kind of presence where, when we're 30 miles away I'm driving you know sometimes you know two or three thousand miles a month and so I'm trying to uh, keep up with a community uh, where sometimes I'm not working there you know and mm, so, right. um, so the flow of life for us often involves an app on our phone talking mm. back and forth and keeping it it was important to have that app on the phone <laughs> Because uh, 
because we wanted to keep it separate from the uh, hellacious amounts of email that we have, um, mm. you know, and that kind of thing. We wanted to keep it separate from the random texts from mom or the random texts right. from this person just going, okay, thanks, you know, that kind of thing. We right. wanted to make sure it was a little bit of a sacred space. Um, mm. So so that's the importance of that. As far as the neighborhood itself and the rhythm of life, um, we do a lot of dinners. We do a lot of parties. We do a lot of, um, I, I have a fire pit thing in the backyard. Uh, last night we were gathered around that kind of talking a little bit. Just um, And a lot of the stuff we do is just, if we see the neighbors cooking out, we're going to go lean over the fence. And mm. that turns into something bigger most of the time. But yeah. yeah. It's nice. really seizing the opportunities that you see God kind of giving you. And if you're in the neighborhood, if you're present, Alan Hirsch talks a whole lot about, um, you know, presence in the place and proximity. Uh, right. if, you, if you're within proximity of neighbors and people who don't know Jesus, if you place yourself there, then things will start to happen. Uh, and that's right. one of our things. And then, uh, yeah, presence is huge. So. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, which is essentially key to your vision of having people yeah. kind of in that particular neighborhood, yeah. because then it's easy for you to quickly, hey, we are just had an impromptu barbecue with our neighbors, and they can just walk down and kind of join you, whether or not they're in your mission yep. community. So, uh, well, tell me a little bit about the actual, uh, when those two hours that you do gather, uh-huh. uh, kind of, what does that look like? What does that two hour look like right now? Um... It depends on the week, but a lot of times I would say it sucks. Excuse my language. Excuse my French. It's okay. Um, it's okay. And then a lot of times it's awesome. It just depends. Um, number one, because we don't have a set time, we run into the whole, well, we're throwing stuff at a wall to see what sticks and what works with our rhythm of life. We've, we've got uh, four young kids in the families, um, a lot of crying, a lot of different things. Um, so sometimes the kids are involved and they can sing and with us and we play guitar and sing some songs and mm-hmm. use the Apple TV to throw some lyrics up on a screen or something. Um, mm-hmm. And then sometimes they go off and play. Other times, and most of the time, we hire a babysitter uh, for one of the couples in the group and we go over to the other person's house and mm-hmm. uh, and hang out. And, and and go through either scripture, we pray together. We usually do scripture, pray together. Um, occasionally we'll sing some songs. Um, and we've just delved into some stuff with Soma uh, communities and they've, they've got a good series of, I think it's 20 something videos of 30 minutes a piece uh, mm-hmm. where they're diving into the whole, um, the whole uh, missional community. What's it like to be missional community mm-hmm. developing DNA um, that sort of thing, and Vanderstelt teaches over a whiteboard, and that's uh, it's legit stuff. So, um, so we're going yeah, through that uh, yeah. right now as a community and kind of getting our basis. Yeah, Soma has kind of pioneered in a lot of ways this uh, approach. Um, sure. For North America, in a lot of sense, uh, there in uh, Tacoma, and uh, now it's been to other places, and uh, so I've gleaned a lot from from those guys. And a lot of what they do is applicable to whichever approach yeah, or model you choose. Um, right, right, yeah. and they they're multi-site in a yeah. sense because they have they have maybe have you can call them expressions, but they have yeah. kind of multiple sites, and then so it's it's a it's a it's a great it's a one great church to learn from because they do kind of have everything and help you out. So. Uh, and I do like you throwing out these resources. I'm, I'm writing them down because I think these are really good to kind of oh, you know, add some links crazy. into the course. So, uh, yeah, man. Your input's going I'm, crazy. I'm going to have you teaching this class next oh, time. Gosh, gosh, and then you just you just start throwing out some resources. Um, well, we, we've talked a little bit about the, kind of the, the weekly rhythm, uh, the neighborhood, um, kind of what that night looks like. Um, but one thing that's um, you know kind of different with a lot of house church approaches, and, and even among house churches. Now I'm, I'm saying house church just for the sake of uh, the conversation, though. Um, you know, missional community does have a lot of times a different idea than a house church, because sometimes a house church can just simply be we don't like the big, we don't like preaching, we don't right. like the you know the the buildings and the budgets and the whichever, and so we just want to have a simple service in our home. Sure. Uh, but they can they can they can be highly uh, intimate and relational and lack mission. Um, or they can be uh, very, very focused on mission, but lack even intimacy, even though sure. they're in a home because they're in a, you know. So there's there's different ways. So for you guys, um, tell me a little bit about how 
uh, leadership is structured? And sure. I know this is a, a, a kind of a, not really a loaded question, uh, sure. but I'm asking for the sake of, since we mostly come from a background of more traditional approach, where there's a senior lead pastor, yeah. there's deacons, there's other pastors, there's staff and that sort of thing. Um, and I know some, um, I'm familiar with a house church group uh, in Kentucky that does have a pastor, and there's, I think there are nine or ten house churches now in the network, and they gather about four times a year for like celebration services, similar to what you had mentioned. Um, but he is paid by each of the the house churches kind of pays this one guy even though he's not at every single house church meeting throughout the week he's kind of sure. so there's different ways so tell me a little bit about the leadership structure um and i'll i'll i'll, I'll just say that and let you uh right you know, give right. your answer because i don't want do you I, want I don't to want load to, it up anymore for me i, I don't i don't okay. but that's as far as i'm gonna go kind of <laughs> yeah uh, well in the books let's go with what's in the books right now i would be called the pastor okay and I would be setting the vision um, for what these communities would do, uh, what they would be uh, headed out to do, or if I would see a, I don't know, like a citywide vision, let's say, that would be my role. But, the, but you see, that would be my role because that's my gifting. That would be how God has gifted me. Um, you know, we've taken the APEST assessment from uh, Alan Hirsch, and he's redone it lately, and that's a... It's been a, a huge improvement, um, but I'm I'm severely apostolic. I, I'm I'm uh, more apostolic than anything else. You do not want me to shepherd somebody. I have shepherding, um, you know. I think apostolic on that was 38, and shepherding was like two. So I mean, I was just overwhelmingly yeah. apostolic. But um, the rest of my group is not. So mm. when I lead out. I'm going to lead out towards multiplication. I'm going to lead out towards uh, developing leaders and sending them uh, strategic things that God is doing, me seeing things that maybe uh, other people aren't seeing. And then um, other people in the group who have taken the APEST uh, might have, um, you know, the fivefold ministry. They might have shepherding or teaching. And so uh, one of our guys has teaching, and he is so much better at doing that online uh, Slack chat thing. And uh, he is the one that's always writing up the things on the Bible reading channel on our forum. And he's the one that's always looking to get together and go through this verse or that verse and stuff. And so he really leans hard in that direction. Uh, we have a person who is just an incredible listener. She is a shepherd for sure. Um, she is she is someone who cares. She feels uh, people's pain very easily, um, and she's able to kind of sense whether everybody's on the same page or whatever. Um, so, in a lot of respects, I have a I have a very open hand with some leadership. Now, as far as doctrinal stuff or, or whatnot, I I I'm pretty. We made sure we got on the same page with a lot of that stuff before we ever got the right people in the room. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah so yeah. we're not we're not fumbling through you know random theologies that that are, you know, you know, heresies and different things like that. But um, are we working out our various small little things? Sure. Um, but that's been nice to be on the same page in a huge way from the get go. Um, that way vision can take hold, the apostolic, all those fivefold things can take uh, hold a whole lot easier when you know you're on the same page and you can kind of start utilizing people for their strengths and trust them uh, in a very biblical way. So as far as the leadership, I'll push the buttons that need to be pushed. But mm -hmm. if somebody else can push a button and, and I don't let them push it and I try to be controlling leader and push it myself, it doesn't go as far. So I recognize, mm -hmm. uh, have you ever read uh, Starfish and the Spider? No, I've heard of it, but I haven't yeah, read it. Yeah. It's a little bit older, and there will be some references to, like, net, what's the old uh, internet browser, net, netscape, net something, <laughs> whatever. It's not I from remember, the early but 2000s, but... Um, oh, so long ago. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but it's such a solid idea um, about how things, ideas groups, organizations splinter and spread. Uh, if you kill a spider, the basic idea is that it'll die. If you try to, if you if you hit its head, excuse me, it'll die. <laughs> if you kill a spider, it'll die. 
if you hit it on the head, it'll die. If you um, if you cut off a leg of a starfish, it'll you can cut off all four legs of the starfish, and it'll expand into uh, different starfish, and so it'll grow into new ones. So that's the way we want this to grow, this movement of missional communities. And so maybe house church is the wrong term because it's really yes, it's based in homes, but it could be based anywhere. It could be based you know out of work or whatever. We want right. to see leadership uh, open sourced enough that I'm able to hand it off so that somebody owns it throughout the process and I'm able to speak in truth where I need to speak in and let mm-hmm. them run it into the ground if they need to, to kill it or right. let it uh, fly and let God take it from there. So there is an open-handed kind of leadership with this process. And if you don't have an open-handed leadership, uh, it'll die anyway. The missional mm-hmm. community approach is not one that can be structured hierarchically. Right. You say you don't have an organizational chart posted on the wall in your living room. Uh, we, we have a <laughs> wash all employees what must wash their hands uh, sign. So we figured that's just good enough. <laughs> it's FSU unity there, right? Yeah. Um, well, um, so, so in many traditional uh, churches, um, you know, the, the pastor has his salary coming from the, the ties of the church. And a lot of planters either, uh, you know, especially starting off, have some type of funding. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the funding aspect sure. of, of this approach. Um, because as guys are, you know, uh, thinking of what they're going to lead and the, the approach that they're going to take, you know, so how does how did funding work for you uh, when you were preparing? Because in the week you got, uh, I was looking at some sample uh, prospectuses this morning of other uh, church planters, and one guy needed to raise $200,000 for the first year of operation, I'm like, wow, um, you know, that's a lot more I could do with 200 grand. Uh, but so there's there's that kind of high end um, approach. There are some who just no, nope, I just moved into the neighborhood, got a job. Um, so tell me a little bit about how you did uh, funding for you personally, and then also, um, is there any salaries that happen inside of your church? Uh, is anyone paid for what they do? Is any of the yeah. ties going to that? So let's, let's flesh that out a little bit. You're gonna make me state my opinion, aren't you? Um, Possibly. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's biblically wrong, obviously, to have a salary or anything like that from a church. Um, okay, so I, I work for the Baptist State Convention in North Carolina, and what I do is I help collegiate ministries get started across the state of North Carolina. And so we have 155, 160 schools, and we're trying to have a gospel presence on every one of those schools. And so we want no campus left without a gospel presence. So that's what I do for work. So really, uh, that's a separate ministry that's going on that I try mm-hmm. to bridge the gap in as many ways as I can. Um, if we can help start missional communities through those things, and I think that missional communities work really well on college campuses, um, then I'll do that. If it mm-hmm. doesn't work, then I won't do that. I can contextualize pretty well um, in order to do that. But that's how I get my salary. Uh, you know, I'm blessed to be able to have that. Uh, we have another guy in our community who works, um, as a police officer. We have another person who works, uh, with a local nonprofit in High Point. And, uh, uh actually we have three people that work with another, uh, nonprofit in, in mm-hmm. High Point. And so there are some different avenues of, uh, funding streams and stuff that, it's mostly a, a regular life kind of average Joe kind of approach. I mean, other than me working for a Baptist organization um, as a consultant, um, that's that's the uh, it's more of a normal thing. You just kind of take me and make me a mechanic or whatever else, and it would be a normal salary kind of thing. And that's the mission right. field we had. To, so tr- we're, that's what we're trying to perpetuate is where it doesn't take any money to do it. Uh, so it's almost, almost like a bivocational approach, basically, sure. um, if we want to kind of give it a label, uh, so to speak. Yeah, uh, but, but everyone's bivocational. It's important to right. state that it's not just me bivocational. It's that everyone in the group chooses to be bi- bivocational. If someone came to me and said, hey, could I raise support to do X, Y, or Z with a community? I'd have to, th- I'd have to really pray about that um, because I'm not sure that in some, to some degree – it wouldn't really screw up some things. Um, a lot of the credibility we have is in the neighborhood is because we have jobs. It's because you know everybody else who owns their own company or does woodworking or does something with the high point uh, furniture market or whatever, they're working. And uh, it's, it's super important 
to be able to um, to be able to relate in those ways. So, um, so yeah, as far as funding goes, we didn't, you know, a lot of church plants can get funding uh, when they plant from a, a local convention or association or finding grants and doing those kind of things. I wanted to be very cautious of that because, yeah, I mean, early on, we probably would have accepted the money, you know, if we had done that way. But right. I really think it was important for us to start off by not receiving a ton of money because, um, you know, when somebody looks at it, they, they need to be able to replicate or, I don't know, emulate, follow me, you know, follow follows, he follows Christ, you know, that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. we wanted to do it somewhat as close to right as we could get it, you know. Um, and with that, I do think with the missional community approach, if you're trying to do it in the neighborhoods, and you want it to spread like wildfire, and you want it to, to raise up leaders quickly, um, yeah, man, it's hugely beneficial to not be sitting there worried about money the entire time. It's right. a big deal. And so, it's just sim- simple and reproducible. Yes, and so yeah. while, it, while it is still excellent to receive and have people wanting to pay a salary or wanting to do whatever, let me give you an example. We tie them to our church, um, and our community ties in. And they said, "Okay, Evan, your pipe busted on your house." And we're like, "Yeah, it did." Uh, they said, "We want to cover that for you." And we're like, "Oh, that's awesome." That wasn't us suggesting it because we're planting churches. That was the rest of our community saying, "We want to pile money in the middle of the table and say." This goes to you guys while y'all are in a financial pinch. Uh, pinch. Mm-hmm. And so we want to make sure that that's, um, we're able to do that. We said, hey, there is a tree leaning over this person's house, but we want to make sure that it gets cut down before it falls on their house. So we have the money as a church that we can pour into that and say, mm-hmm. hey, that's going to happen. So if a neighbor says, we, we don't have the money to send our kids to camp, we want to do this, and we say, hey, how can we support you? Your car needs fixing. There's a lot of fluidity in the money of the church that we uh, we haven't had in the past that because we're not paying salaries that we can actually do that. Does that make sense? It's not tied, so, yeah, it's not tied up into um, yeah. a building or yeah. maintenance and that sort of thing. It's yeah. whatnot, we, so. We've got a person in our church who we're able to help support who hasn't had a work visa, but she's able to live in the country but she doesn't have a work visa, so she's not able to legally work for, for money. And so she's able to volunteer for her job and we're able to pay uh, for her bank gotcha. to help with that. So that gotcha. those kind of things don't happen uh, when your money's tied out. And that's gotcha. just a reality. Gotcha. So it's not criticizing people who accept money. It's just saying right. that's the nature of, that's reality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, cool. Well, well Evan, um, I appreciate your time today. Uh, yeah, this man. has been hugely beneficial. We, I think we covered a lot of good practical topics. And uh, cool. man, uh, before we go, what is uh, one thing that our, our class can pray for Multiplied Church for specifically that's going on right now? Yeah, please pray for us to celebrate the small things. Um, for us to constantly be understanding that uh, God is number one big enough, which is an obvious statement, but we need to be willing to celebrate the things like um, just those little, we reached over the fence and, and shook hands with a new neighbor. We need to, we, we met a new neighbor. We, you know, they brought us coffee. They, you know, those small things that we often say, that's the process that ends with something. Um, we have a tendency to only want to celebrate the end. And mm-hmm. in actuality, we need to celebrate the process whole lot more we're not good at that and we were talking about that last night as a community and um you know we had some things going we were like well how do we how do we get it in our neighborhood to where they see us as more than just good people who want to be good friends with them and good neighbors how do we do that how do we get to that point of gospeling them in a community and in reality we're not giving ourselves a very long runway it really takes years to do this kind of thing and ch- normal church planting um with a launch team and everything, we would say, all right, where are you in a year? And yeah. man, it, it isn't like that. These are people who aren't going to be even attracted to the normal church. So um, we've got to be careful not to uh, bash what God is doing, not to, um, uh, you know, you get what I'm saying? So yeah. it, it's important yeah. to celebrate those very small things that are actually big things. 
though. Very Help, cool. Well, pray for us to to be honest about those things that God is doing, and uh, definitely, to know definitely. that this is a huge marathon, not just a short sprint. Mm. And those hundred communities that I wanted to start by now, and already multiply into those little churches all over the city of High Point. I would love for that to happen, mm. but it's okay that it takes years to do that. It's it's yeah. it didn't happen in my five five year plan yet. You know what I mean? Mm. So. Right, yeah, right. Man. Well, uh, man, I, I can't thank you enough for you for your insight, and uh, you've kind of helped explain pretty much all the models in a lot of ways. So you've kind of covered everything that I uh, need Great. to cover in a different lesson. So, man, you just. I'm, I'm just going to sit back and relax and let you grade the uh, quiz right. this week, too. So, all right. Well, hey, man, uh, tomorrow uh, we'll have our class period. We're definitely going to pray for your church and uh, pray for you as you lead these people on mission in, into your community there in High Point. And if we can be a service to you, let us know. And uh, appreciate your time. I'd love to get together and grab coffee with anybody in your crew. Oh, hey. Has, hey, bring some donuts and we'll make it a, we'll make it a day. I might, right, take even, care, buddy. I might even buy. You can give them my email address. <laughs>